Well, I don't want to talk about the law because I think you know enough. Enough has been said by the ISA of how, how aggressive it is, how unfair it is, how painful it is, how much anguish it costs the victims. The, the, the many Malaysians who have been detained and given their stories, their narration of their experiences, I think we all know. But what I think most people don't realize is that the ISA is just one of many detention laws in Malaysia. It is more glamorous because of normally politicians are detained on the ISA. So everybody talks about repealing ISA. But and if you repeal ISA, you can still detain people in Malaysia. Because we are under an emergency. We have we have four emergencies. You see, under our constitution, the government has the right to proclaim can proclaim an emergency. And once that proclamation is made, it kicks off certain powers of the government, <coughs> powers to pass laws relating to detention without trial. We had the confrontasi, remember, with Indonesia, that emergency proclamation. Then we had a political crisis in Kelantan, my home state, 1978. <coughs> then we had a political crisis in Sarawak, so Kalamika. And of course, we had the famous 1969 riot. So we have four proclamations of emergency in Malaysia. So until you revoke this proclamation, you can detain. You can detain under public order uh, legislation. You can detain under dangerous drugs ordinance. You can detain under restricted residence. You can detain people or other legislation, under other legislation. So, when everybody talks about ISA, because ISA is the most commonly used by government against prominent people. But if you detain the normal Joe Blow, Aman Aitong, Siva Lingam, <laughs> and put you in Johor, put you somewhere in the remote places, under the other legislation, nobody talks about it. So, my point is this. <coughs> What we have to fight for is not just ISA, but this whole sets of governmental powers under these various legislations. Because we are no longer under an emergency. We have always take pride about this country as being peaceful. Tourists love Malaysia, truly Asia. You remember the famous advertisement? Why would people go to a country when it's called an emergency? But government needs courage. You need a strong leader, a good leader, to repeal this legislation. You know, my former boss, Dr. Sri Abdullah Badawi now, I mean, he's a good man. But when it comes to the crunch, he dare not take on the might of his own party. And of course, before him, of course, we had the great man himself, Adam. <laughs> He was the great destroyer. <laughs> yeah. I know before 1988, you could still go to court if someone detains you under the ISA or the authorities detain you under the ISA. You can still go to court. There is such a thing as a judicial review powers. I think lawyers in the school in the common law tradition understand. You, know, you don't have to have legislation. The courts have that inherent power to do justice. We had that before 1988. But the great man himself said no. So there was an amendment, and the courts they were taken up ex expressly the power to review, to review. And this is why Malaysia is so depressing. Because whilst other countries have detention powers as well, for a limited period, they don't normally exclude the courts' powers to review. But we do that. So we need to look at that as well. We need to give back the powers to the courts. These were the things that I wanted to do in my short tenure, but I wasn't able to. Not for lack of trying, but it's just not, I suppose, the beast is too strong. <laughs> you just have to get the liar to be involved in a, in a long struggle. The Prime Minister, the present Prime Minister, uh, when he took office, uh, he gave a promise that he would look for this uh, ISA and, and legislation 
such as ISA. Uh, I remember he said something like this. He said that uh, he wanted to engage the people of the country. Uh, he wanted to make sure that uh, just to be a bit, I don't know how to use this Facebook. Oh, this what do you call it? iPad. <laughs> okay, he said this. He said that uh, he wants politicians to have hope of a better future. He, he promised to reach out to all parts of the country, to all relations, and he wanted a national discourse. He assured us that in pursuing the national agenda, no one will be left behind. And he gave his solemn pledge that the government will conduct a comprehensive review of the Internal Security Act and other laws shortly. Now it's been 30 months. So I would like to remind the Prime Minister that in all the people of this country, this promise. I am not saying, and I think many Malaysians and many people say, you see, there are countries with preventive detention laws for a short term period. For a short period. I mean, you have that in as well against terrorists. You have that in America. You have that in Australia. You have that in Singapore. You have that in many places. But what's different is that in all these countries, the period of detention is very limited. It's either four weeks, six weeks, you know, along that time. Because I think you have to recognize that the police do need time. And sometimes when they're faced with imminent danger, they have to act. So we recognize that there should be a period where people can detain, terrorists especially. So we're not against detention at all. We're saying that there should be a limited period and they should be subject to review. I believe that even in Israel, a country that is at war, is still a perpetual war, even in Israel, they have this power of detention, but the government still has to go to a judge in chambers to explain why this power has to be exercised. So there is that check and balance. The tragedy in our country is not just that these laws are harsh. We don't really know who's in charge. You all, I think you have read or you have heard of statements just now about Mahade saying that, well, he wanted to, he didn't know about the oppression at the beginning. You may think it's a joke, but it's probably true. And I say that because, from my own experience, when Petra was detained, and the, the photographer I was detained, I asked this question of the Prime Minister then. I said, why do we do this? I think we wanted to change, we wanted to reform. Why do we need to detain all these people? And the Prime Minister then, I said, I didn't know about this. Now, I don't think he was lying to me. In our country, the power to detain for the first 60 days is actually with the police. That is the law. Of course, I'm not saying the minister should not be accountable, responsible, I'm not saying that. But the unfortunate thing in our country is the police is a power on its own. And this is scary. Because the police, it seems, can dictate. I remember when I was in parliament, a member of parliament, and I was supporting the, the government's effort there to establish this, what we call the, a monitoring body to, to look at the abuses by the police, the police misconduct, AIPMC. And I can tell you that the Prime Minister agreed with the idea <coughs> in the beginning. The Prime Minister agreed with the idea, and I believe some cabinet ministers do. And I was very vocal in support of this in Parliament. But I know that the police top brass there was very much against it. And I've heard from my own ears about so-called veiled threats to the government. You must remember that our political system, the police have got votes as well. But the UND control them. There are some constituencies where the policemen can decide whether you win or you lose. So it's a very powerful lobby. And I think politicians need to be very brave to, to, to face this, this warlords in the police force. 
this is a real problem. I wanted to understand. It's not as straightforward as that. And of course, after the 60 days, it comes to the minister. I mean, he has to sign the extension, the detention order. But nine out of ten ministers will not go against the police authority, in my experience. That's true. And that's the unfortunate thing that in our country now we have another power. That we have the politicians <laughs> who are supposed to be our super of people and go back to get a mandate. And then you have the police, and certain forces within the government. It's very strong, very powerful. And I remember still during the controversy of my resignation. I think I remember the press conference. The Home Minister there was at home, and he was asked the grounds for this detaining of the street. I remember he said, I didn't know about the detention. And I believe him. So you see, in our country, it's unique. Things happen in our country that don't happen anywhere else. <laughs> but it's true. And that is why it's so important, it's so important that this Prime Minister, and I think he has made that promise, I don't know whether he has the time <coughs> or the courage to do it, but he has to do it. Not for anything, for the betterment of the government itself. Never mind the, the other reasons that we talk about democracy and all that. If you want the police force to be a properly functional, professional police force, you must clean up the police force. And the way to do it is to remove some of these laws. So, for example, if I am the police chief in the district, if, the police chief, if I'm a corrupt police, and you know, drug is a big business. What do I do with the drug order? What do I do with those fellows? I don't charge them. I would probably just put them in a detention in some places for a while because I have the power under the dangerous drugs ordinance. There's so much potential for abuse by the enforcement agencies if you keep these laws. So if the Prime Minister wants to clean up the government, make them, you know, with better, with all his transformation plans. You have to make the police and enforcement agencies better. If you have to charge someone, you have to be professional, you have to prepare your case, you have to have proper investigation done. That's how you make the police better. But if you have detention powers that nobody can question, why would you want to do the hard work? But that's what's happening. So we need this because we need to clean up we need to make the police force and other enforcement agencies, police not just other enforcement agencies. And that is why I think it is paramount for police. If you want to be a first world lead, if you want to be, if, if the transformation that the Prime Minister talked about has to have any meaning, you have to make our country just like other first world countries. We cannot have repressive laws, we cannot have a corrupt or a police force that no one can question. We cannot have that. Do you remember in 2008, a deputy minister in the government openly, openly made statements about the Inspector General of Police then, that he was connected with the underworld. Where would you get that sort of in any other country? Because that deputy minister, although he was a deputy minister, he was in the Prime Minister's department. I mean, these are allegations made within or uh, by government officials. So if you want to address all this, the corruption, the abuse of power and all that, plus making us look good in the UN or looking good at the, some democratic forum, I think the Prime Minister has to keep his promise, look at the ISA and all other legislation relating to preventive detention, and I think this is a sort of transformation that people are looking for. This is a sort of leadership that the country needs. And this is a sort of change that I think Malaysia is right and ready to accept. And I hope uh, this small contribution uh, of mine will be helpful in your understanding of these issues. Thank you very much.